China's own publicly available laws say data that is stored in China can and will be accessed by the government, the Chinese government, on demand. So what does that mean? That means that these information on the phone, who it is uh, receiving calls from, who is sending calls to, in theory, who you are emailing, text messaging to and from, is data that could be uploaded back in China by Chinese authorities. So our next guest says China is the most persistent and consequential foreign policy challenge that will confront the U.S. for the next several decades and that the U.S. doesn't need simply a game plan for managing competition with China. It needs a strategy for winning. Well, I spoke with the senior fellow for the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, Dean Chang. Dean, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So, look, challenge may even be an understatement. I actually think the United States and China are at war. What say you? Well, uh, we're obviously not shooting at each other, um, but we are absolutely in a strategic competition. And from Beijing's perspective, this is ultimately a matter of regime survival. Um, the Chinese leadership, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, even Deng Xiaoping, who is probably as pro open to the West as, as any Chinese leader has ever been, constantly warned about the threat of westernization, the threat of peaceful evolution, uh, and warned that the West was out to undermine the CCP's rule. And uh, every subsequent Chinese leader, certainly including the current one, Xi Jinping, acts like that is the case. What is it about China that despises the United States that would like to see our economy crushed? I mean, I would expect that China needs the United States just as much, sadly, as the United States needs China when it comes to a, to a global economy. For a global economy, sure. But I think it's important to recognize that from the CCP's perspective, their intention is not to create a global economy. It is to create a massive Chinese economy. That, uh, you know, if, if Donald Trump was somehow in the wrong to uh, push an America first policy, Xi Jinping certainly is seen to be in the right for pushing a China first policy. And indeed, the China dream, his hallmark political uh, message, uh, could be encapsulated as making China great again, uh, because that is the great revival of the Chinese people. That is what literally the China dream is, if you read what the Chinese themselves say, what the China dream is. And so the United States is the greatest obstacle to that. We are currently still the leading superpower. We are a fount of technology, which the Chinese want to purchase war steel, but which we refuse to allow them to buy war to steal. And they want to dominate the region, which means overcoming key U.S. allies, Japan, the Republic of Korea, uh, and key friends, Taiwan, Singapore. Look, even if at the very least you say they're a challenge to us, when, when I would think that some would offer up that they could be an enemy of ours, uh, China controls so much in the United States. We see they control many of our food manufacturing and processing plants. Uh, they have uh, stuff that is in the electricity grid, transformers and the like. They control much of the property that is being bought up, including farmland across America. We are beholden to the Chinese right now. From an economic standpoint, I'm sure that's great for them, but also from a strategic standpoint, to stick it to America, we're, we're, we're literally under their thumb in many respects. Well, first off, I think it's important to put uh, at least some of those statistics in context. Um, yes, China owns U.S. farmland, several hundred thousand acres. In a country the size of the United States, that is not uh, some overwhelming uh, ownership. What is worrisome is where China has chosen to buy some of that land. Uh, places in Grand Forks, North Dakota, uh, near U.S. ICBM silos, near U.S. air bases. It isn't ownership of farmland. It is what they could build on the farmland that they own, including observation towers, surveillance sites, etc. Um, yes, China is part of our supply chains, and that unfortunately has been a decision made by U.S. companies to rely more on China. But it is also, again, important to recognize that we are part of Chinese supply chains, and the reality is that China's uh, Huawei cell phone maker, those cell phones around the world are right now very pretty paperweights because of policies enacted by the previous administration and upheld by this one, where Huawei cannot upload Android apps. And if you can't upload an app, your cell phone's a lot less useful. Um, right now, we are mutually dependent. The worrisome, the really worrisome aspect here, going to your point, is China is actively trying to make itself less dependent on the outside world and make the rest of the world more dependent on China. And our side is, frankly, asleep at the switch. 
Well, when you talk about technology, uh, President Trump was out at the forefront of this issue of banning TikTok in the United States. I actually went through and read uh, the privacy conditions for TikTok. When you download the app, it specifically says you give TikTok the ability to track your keystrokes, the ability to track where you're going, your search history. It gives them access to your microphone and even your video camera. Um, that is frightening. President Trump was ridiculed early on. Now there's a bipartisan push to do away with TikTok. How dangerous is TikTok? and how dangerous is it the information that China is gathering from its users? So all of that data that, as you note, in the contract, the Ch TikTok is freely allowed to collect, is stored in China. And China's own publicly available laws say data that is stored in China can and will be accessed by the government, the Chinese government, on demand. So what does that mean? That means that these information on the phone, who it is uh, receiving calls from, who is sending calls to, in theory, who you are emailing, text messaging to and from, is data that could be uploaded back in China by Chinese authorities. Now, you could say, oh, but what, what, what does it matter that a 14-year-old is sharing information? Well, what if that 14-year-old happens to be the son or daughter of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs yeah. or the Secretary of State? or the deputy head of the CIA. I mean, that is, do you think that the only information that they have is just among the 14 year olds or do you think their parents' information also starts getting access? Dean, I think we're naive to think it's just 14 year olds using TikTok. There are members of the United States Congress that use TikTok as a social media outlet because of its popularity and uh, they could be tracking everything uh, on, uh, on that member of Congress's cell phone. Absolutely. Uh, and not, again, not just government folks, right? Uh, TikTok is also going to be popular among corporate executives. And that's an awful lot of information. The Chinese have literally been hoovering up intellectual property, personal data, all of that information. And TikTok, because it's sitting on people's cell phones, you're not even thinking about it. Anything that is passing over your cell phone is, in theory, going to be accessible and diverted back to China. Last question for you. Do you think this administration is set up to protect us against China the way President Trump's administration did? I think that when we look at how this administration has eagerly sought and continues to seek out Chinese support, quote unquote, on issues like climate change, when you have the climate advisor, John Kerry, saying, you know, what really matters is what's made in Xinjiang, not what happens to the people who live in Xinjiang. I think the message that we are sending to Beijing is very different from the one the previous administration was saying. Well, there are certainly lots of questions about the Biden family ties to China. Uh, we've asked many of those questions right here on this program as well. Dean Chang, we appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. TikTok consistently ranks as one of the top most downloaded apps in this country. Precisely what China wants, right? What is up with that? We'll talk about it in 90 seconds. As with so many online invitations, TikTok has captured the interest of not just our children, but many young adults too. Is it fun? Sure it is, like making videos for America's Funniest Home Videos. But in this case, the Chinese company that owns it, ByteDance, is using it to gather all sorts of data from whoever signs on. Well, Carl Sabo is here to explain what that danger means to you and your children and even national security. Carl, welcome. Thanks for having me. So, well, look, I've looked at the privacy uh, rundown from TikTok. It says it can track my keystrokes, my microphone, my camera on my phone, everything. Is it really collecting all of this data on us? You know, as somebody who used to write those privacy policies in terms of service, they're actually written incredibly broad and oftentimes don't include a lot of the stuff that is uh, included in the text. So it may say it will track your keystrokes. It might not. It may say that it's going to track your geolocation. It probably doesn't. I've spoken with experts, cybersecurity experts, and people who actually work for TikTok. And basically, the geolocation information that's collected is not precise enough to even deliver you a pizza, but it will use general city location information. The same thing's true about some of the content that it collects. But at the end of the day, one of the things that TikTok has heard loud and clear is the concern about all this data going back to China. So what they've actually done 
is they are creating an incredibly robust system to silo all the U.S. data here in the U.S. And right now they are undergoing a review from our U.S. government, from the Department of Treasury, that will actually take a deep dive, pull back all the layers and figure out, is data going back to China? What is going back to China? And is TikTok really going to keep its promises of keeping American data on American shores. What are they going to do with this data? I mean, when you have data on everything of human behavior, you talk about artificial intelligence, talk about swinging elections, they know everything about Americans. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is the, the data that they're collecting from TikTok, whether I liked a video or didn't like a video, where I may be, what city I'm in, when I go and uh, look at that video, not too useful. What I think demands a much deeper dive is the type of cybersecurity and hacking attempts that we've been seeing from the Chinese party. I mean, for example, the Office of Personal Management, it's a division of the government that collects some of the most sensitive information about every single government official, background clearances, your debt, who you met with, who your spouse is, your social security number, everything. That was hacked several years ago, and I haven't really heard anything from the government about it. Likewise, one of the largest data breaches in our nation was a Texas company called SolarWinds. There hasn't been any follow-up on that. What I'd like to see, regardless of TikTok, I'd like to see across the board the U.S. clamping down on cybersecurity threats and taking significant steps to harden all of our devices, online, offline, and everywhere in between. Well, certainly you're right on that, and that would be in our best interest for, for all of our devices, but even just the likes on TikTok, think about what you are gathering. You know the age of people in most cases of who's gathering that, you see what their likes are, you see what their interests are, you see what dances they like, all the way down to what sports teams they like. If you're trying to affect behavior just by those likes and dislikes, you have a tremendous amount of, people, uh, of information to swing somebody's decision on maybe very important issues that China is focused in on here in the United States. Yeah, I think it's a big concern. And anytime there's election interference, the U.S. government, our elected representatives should swing as hard as they can and come down as hard as they can on these foreign actors. But I do think it is important at the same time to remember that foreign interference is not just coming from China. It's coming from Russia. It's coming from Iran. It's even coming from some of our allies. I mean, this dates all the way back to the 1940s and before then. So what we need is the government to really step up its game, to identify foreign interference when it happens and hold those nations accountable. And one thing we have not seen from this current administration is holding the CCP accountable for nearly anything it did, whether it was COVID-19 or anything in between. Uh, Carl Sabo, uh, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me.